One night the Buddha instructed his disciples through the early hours of the morning. The voice of the Buddha resounded in the clear sky and, hearing the Buddha's voice, the Bodhisattvas of the four directions gathered. At that time the following dialogue developed. Manjushri said, If the mind, which is the basis of actions, is one, why is it that there are so many varied results? Some are born in favorable places. Others are born in unfavorable places. Some are fair, while others are ugly. Regarding suffering and happiness, there are all kinds. Why is it that from one mind there arise so many varied results? In answer to this the Bodhisattva Lokamukha instructed, in regard to all that exists, there is no determined nature. Thus, existing things do not know each other. But we cannot say that there is no connection between or among them. Observe swiftly flowing water, which keeps on flowing endlessly. The flowing water that is already downstream and the flowing water that is still upstream constitute two different rivers. Likewise, the burning flame keeps on burning endlessly, but the flame that burned a while back and the present flame are separate flames. Our five senses and minds work in the same manner. Through each of these senses all kinds of suffering are created, but in reality, each of these sufferings is brought about totally unknown to one another. Thus, the basic nature of things does not of itself cause any suffering, but each action results in suffering. The Bodhisattva Manjushri then posed the question, we know that all beings are combinations of the four great elements and by nature are characterized by non-substantiality. Why then is it that these are the results of suffering, pleasure, good, and evil? Is it not true that in considering the basic nature of dharmas, there should never be good or bad, pure or impure? To this the Bodhisattva Ratnamukha gave the answer, whatever effect arises from one's actions, no other agent causes it to happen. This is similar to the case when a clear mirror reflects one's form as one stands before it. There is no object in the mirror or on the other side of the mirror that causes this to happen. The nature and effect of karmic forces is something like this. For instance, the soil and the seed sown are originally separate, but by the workings of nature they are brought closely together. A person suffering in agony does not suffer because something inflicts the suffering, but rather it is the result of his own action. The Bodhisattva Manjushri then raised this question, we all know that the Buddha was enlightened to one Dharma. So why is it that the Dharma he expounds is unlimited, that his voice resounds throughout the immeasurable worlds, and that his teachings awaken countless beings? To this Bodhisattva Gunamukha answered, he is similar to the basic nature of fire, which is one and yet burns all kinds of things, to the water of the great ocean which does not change in taste even though hundreds of thousands of rivers flow into it, and to the great earth, which also is one yet is able to grow all kinds of seedlings from itself. The Bodhisattva Manjushri then raised another question. We have been told that once a person receives the Buddha's instructions, all of his anxieties should be eradicated. Why is it then that although a person hears the right Dharma, he is not able at once to eliminate all sufferings and anxieties? The Bodhisattva Dharma Mukha responded, What you are describing is a person who listens well but does not practice. One cannot understand and accept the Buddha Dharma by listening alone. Such a person is like someone who is floating on the surface of the water, he becomes unduly afraid of drowning and dies of thirst and dehydration. Flee to accept the Dharma, one must truly follow the way as instructed. Moreover, there are those who starve to death because they refuse to eat, although abundant food is given to them. There is the capable doctor who is well versed in medicine and yet cannot treat himself. There is the poor person who, day in and day out, counts the treasures belonging to another person but does not have even a penny of his own. There is the deaf person who plays beautiful music and brings joy to others but cannot hear a note himself. And again, there is the person who teaches the true Dharma to the many who come to hear him but who, in his inner self, has no true virtue. People who merely listen are exactly like these. The Bodhisattva Manjushri then said, Of the many gems in the Buddha Dharma, wisdom is of the highest value. Despite this, the Buddha, in his instructions to others, highly praises the virtues of practicing charity, observing the precepts, forbearance, endeavor, and mental concentration, as well as compassion, blissfully acting, and gladly sharing with others. By adhering to only one of them, 
could one not attain liberation from one's attachment to the ego? To this the Bodhisattva Bodhimukha answered, Not all the Buddhas throughout the three worlds have attained Buddhahood by adhering to only one Dharma. In fact, the Buddha is fully aware that all beings differ in their capacities. He teaches the Dharma in accordance with their basic natures. To those who do not share things with others, the Buddha praises the act of charity, to those who do not practice the precepts, the Buddha praises the observing of precepts, to those who are easily angered, forbearance is taught. To those who tend to slacken in their actions, the Buddha urges perseverance, to those whose minds tend to wander, the Buddha teaches mental concentration, to those who adhere to ignorance, the Buddha stresses wisdom. To the heartless the Buddha teaches compassion, to those whose intention is to harm others, the Buddha teaches great compassion, to those in agony, the Buddha bestows bliss and happiness, and to those who have strong feelings of hate and craving. The Buddha praises the virtues of equanimity and brotherhood. It is only by employing such means that those who aspire for the first time may gradually understand the truth of all dharmas. To cite an analogy, just as we strengthen the foundation in building a house, the acts of charity and observance of precepts are the foundations of the practice of a bodhisattva. Likewise, just as a fortified castle withstands the onslaught of foes, forbearance and endeavor will protect the bodhisattva. Just as the powerful king governs his country with authority and virtue, mental concentration and wisdom are the means that enable the bodhisattva to achieve peace of mind. Again, as the universal monarch enjoys all the pleasures of this world, the virtues of practicing compassion and selfless giving bring pleasure to the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva Manjushri posed the following question to the bodhisattvas, whereas all Buddhas have crossed the ocean of samsara aboard the one vehicle, why is it that sermons and other means of edification differ in each country? Does it mean that unless one acquires all of these ways of edification, it is impossible to attain enlightenment? To this question the Bodhisattva Badramukha replied, The Dharma of the universe is eternal, the highest Dharma is one Dharma. Those who are freed from all obstructions can be liberated from transmigration by this one Dharma. The body of all Buddhas is the one Dharma here, one mind and one wisdom. All Buddha lands are equally adorned, but because people all have different karma, they do not all see the same thing when they look at them. Thus the Buddha, the Buddha's doctrine, the Buddha's land and the Buddha's discourses cannot be observed in their true light by the ordinary person. Only those who have pure minds and who have achieved their aspirations can see the true, ultimate reality. Such people have opened their clear eyes of wisdom. According to the aspiration of the person, along with his action in the results of that action, the Buddha enables him to see truth itself. This is possible because the power of the Buddha is totally free from all restrictions. In the land of the Buddha no one appears different from another. There is no one who harbors hatred or craving. If any difference appears to a person, then it is the result of his action. The Bodhisattva Bodhimukha then asked, What must a Bodhisattva do in order to realize pure action in regard to body, mouth, and mind, to acquire superior wisdom, to serve as a haven for persons in need, to become the cause of salvation for others, to become an island of refuge, and to become a master and guide of men? To this the Bodhisattva Manjushri answered, When a Bodhisattva serves his parents, he hopes to secure peace for a long time by doing all in his power to protect them and provide for them. When he is with his wife and children, he hopes to be freed from the shackles of love and the bondage of family life. When he listens to music being played, he hopes to enjoy the bliss of the Dharma. When he is in the seclusion of his room, he enters the realm of the wise and hopes to be released forever from any impurities. When he is about to practice charity, he wishes to offer all and be freed from the attachment to things. When he finds himself among his peers, he hopes that it will be a gathering of Buddhas. When he meets with misfortune, he wishes to enjoy a peace of mind, undisturbed by anything. When he seeks refuge in the Buddha, he hopes to arouse the aspiration for enlightenment by experiencing the great path with all beings. When he seeks refuge in the Dharma, he aspires to acquire wisdom as deep as the ocean by immersing himself in the sutras and teachings with all beings. And when he seeks refuge in the Sangha, he together with all beings aspires to be freed from all obstructions by bringing together and guiding all sentient beings. Again, when putting on his clothing he does not forget to regard the roots of good and deep self-reflection as his garments. As he excretes waste, he hopes to free himself of greed, 
anger, and ignorance. As he looks up to the way leading to a higher place, he aspires to free himself from bondage to the three realms by pursuing the way of the highest realm. As he looks at the way leading to a lower place, he aspires to enter deep into the realm of the Buddha's doctrine by becoming yielding and humble. Whenever he sees a bridge, he aspires to build a bridge of the Buddha's doctrine and at all times to help people reach the other shore. When he sees a person in deep anxiety and sorrow, he reminds himself to seek release from attachment to things that are constantly changing and crumbling. Whenever he sees people who indulge in the pleasures of the body, he should aspire to achieve the highest bliss and be freed from the ills of the body. Whenever he sees people in good health, he should hope to realize the diamond like Dharmakaya, forever freed from aging and withering away. Wherever he sees a person stricken with sickness, he should realize the temporary nature of human existence and hope to be freed from all kinds of suffering. Again, when seeing a monk who has renounced all worldly ties, he should quiet and control his mind. When seeing a person engaging in arguments, he should employ his superior persuasive abilities and convince believers of other faiths. When observing a monarch, he must aspire to become a ruler in the Dharma and turn the wheel of the Dharma with no obstructions. When partaking of delicious food, he must exercise temperance, limiting his wants and not being attached to the desires of the flesh. When given untempting food, he should push aside attachment. At extremely hot times, he should push away the heat of craving and desires and try to achieve cool and placid concentration and when it is freezing cold, he should hope to achieve the cool quietude of deliverance. Again, when reading a sutra, he should adhere completely to the Dharma. When looking at the Buddha, upon having acquired the eyes of the truth of the Buddha, he should wish to see that which is superior to all that exists. When retiring at night, having the activities of the mind, speech, and body subdued, he must purify his mind and aspire to be freed from impurities. When waking in the morning, he must aspire to become aware of all things by realizing the highest truth. These are the ways by which the Bodhisattva controls his actions of body, speech, and mind. This is the way by which all virtues may be attained. The Bodhisattva Manjushri then asked for a clarification of the virtue of aspiring for enlightenment. I have elaborated on the pure actions of a Bodhisattva, but what is the great virtue of such actions and what are their profound implications? To this the Bodhisattva Badramukha answered, A Bodhisattva, while in the realm of samsara, aspires to follow the way, and the virtues of even one thought are indeed vast and unlimited. The Buddha nature is the cause, the teachings are the conditions. It is only by these causes and conditions that deep trust can be put in the Buddha. Not to seek pleasure or treasures or fame or easy ways, but to relieve people of their suffering, this must be your aspiration. It is only upon putting one's faith in the Buddha's doctrine and in the ways of a Bodhisattva that a Bodhisattva can arouse the thought of enlightenment. Faith is truly the basis of the way and the mother of all virtues. By continuing to do good and eradicating all doubts, one can realize the highest way. Faith drives away impurity. Upon clearing the mind, it eradicates arrogance and becomes the source of respect by others. Faith is placed in the Dharma store and is the first of all treasures. It becomes the pure hand that receives merits. Faith is giving to all with no limitations, and the bliss of faith enables one to enter the realm of the Buddha's doctrine. Faith enhances the virtues of wisdom and enables one to realize Buddhahood without fail. Faith makes manifest all workings of the Buddha's doctrine, its strength is firm, never to be broken. It also eliminates the causes of anxieties and leads people to seek the Buddha's merits. Faith sets no boundaries and spares one from calamities. It enables one to transcend the realms of the demons and realize the highest enlightenment. Faith is the source of unbreakable virtues and is the seedling of the tree of wisdom. As it develops, it makes manifest the virtues of the Buddha. Faith is excellent and not easily attainable, truly like the Udumbara blossom. When one has constant faith in the Dharma, one will never tire of listening to the Dharma. When one has trust in the Sangha at all times, that faith will never waver. The deeds of a person of faith are pure, and this enables one to approach good people, to do good, and to acquire great power. One's wisdom keeps growing, and one is protected by the Buddhas at all times. Therefore aspire for the way, follow the ways of the Buddha, be born in the house of the Buddha, and pursue the practices of wondrous skillful means. The mind that believes and rejoices is pure, this unexcelled mind grows, enables the person of faith to practice the six perfections, 
and makes one aspire all the more to follow the way of the Buddha. Thus a mind set on the Buddha, never unstable, enables one to see at all times the Buddha of unlimited virtues. Having seen that the Buddha is eternal, having known that the Dharma will never crumble, and having acquired the power of speaking impressively, he now spreads the boundless Dharma, leading people well guided by sympathy. With a mind of great compassion, he enjoys the profound Dharma. By his efforts the true Dharma will prevail in the world, never to crumble, and all the good, all the ways, and all the excellent treasures will appear in this world, for those who do not know of the ways leading to spiritual release, and for those who tend to cling to samsara, a bodhisattva discards country and treasures and seeks the quietude of serenity, renouncing all worldly attachments, again, even if he chooses to stay in the world and give guidance to all beings, he is not polluted by worldly impurities, just as the lotus blossom remains pure. And when perverted views led one to suffering, he employs skillful means to present the Dharma, leading people to enlightenment. A bodhisattva makes the Buddha manifest and shows the way leading to the Dharma and the Sangha. Those who receive this light are able to realize the highest enlightenment by its unlimited virtues. The light of the Buddha leads one to awakening, makes one aspire for the way, and ferries one across the ocean of craving and desires. The light leads one to awakening and with the water of deliverance removes the thirst of lust and desires. The light leads one to awakening and enables one happily to enjoy and pursue the way of the Buddha. The light leads one to awakening and enables one to realize that nothing really exists and that there is no true non-existence, that everything is like the moon reflected in water, and that everything is an illusion. The light leads one to awakening, and while enabling the Dharma to prevail, it leads one to respect the good and pure and protect the wise. It enables the unlimited virtues of the Dharma to flow. The light leads one to awakening and enables one to think on the Buddha, observe the Buddha, and realize birth in the Buddha's land. The light leads one to awakening, to hear the Dharma, to expound on it, to let others share the joy, to guard it, to transmit it, and to let the true Dharma prevail. The light leads one to awakening and enables one to make all voices in the world sound as the voice of the Buddha. One with eyesight can see the sun, but the blind cannot. Those who seek the way can see the light, but those of perverted views cannot. The jewel but ect castle, the treasure vehicle, sweet foods, and gems are all received naturally by the virtuous but never by the non-virtuous. There are many inconceivable things in life, such as one's karmic forces, the skillful changes of form by dragons, and the powers of the gods, but there is nothing to match the power of the Buddha. A warrior with a sword can be seen reflected on the limpid surface of water without showing any trace of hate or craving. The freedom of the Buddha's mind is exactly the same. Those who attain perfect freedom, who have the merit to save all beings with a voice sweet and mellow, have the power to suppress demons and to bring happiness to all without fail. I have now made known to you the merits of those who have entered the sea of the Dharma and have fathomed it. Those who are now exposed to the Dharma should accept it and spread it to others. When the Bodhisattva Badramukha taught these words, the worlds in the ten directions shook strongly six times. The palaces of the demons ceased to glow, and all the ways of evil disappeared.